Harold Godfrey Lowe was born on November 21st, 1882, in his grandfather's home of Wolf Hill, in this area of North Wales, to George Edward Lowe and Emma Harriet Quick. Harold was the third of seven children, having an older brother, George Ernest, an older sister, Ada Florence, a younger sister, Annie May, and three younger brothers, Edgar, Arthur, and Edward. The Lowe family moved to the coastal town of Barmouth, North Wales, in 1893 and resided in a home known as Penrold. Here, Harold's father George ran a successful branch of the family business, Lowe and Sons, with which the family were known as successful silversmiths, goldsmiths, jewelers, and watchmakers. There were also stores in Chester and Liverpool, but the Chester store still exists today. It's located on Bridge Street Row and has conducted business on the same site since 1804. Lowen Sons technically closed in 2018, but the new owners, Powell's Fine Jewelry, decided to keep the Lowen Sons name and even chose to convert the upper floor to a small museum dedicated to Barmouth's hometown hero. Tragedy struck the Lowe family on December 27, 1895, when Harold's older brother George died in a boating accident at the age of 17. What exactly happened isn't certain, but it's presumed that he had fallen while securing his boat for the evening, and, being unable to swim, tragically drowned. Harold was just 13 years old. He nearly followed his brother a year later in similar circumstances, having capsized in the bay during the storm, but he luckily managed to swim back to shore. By the time Harold was 14, his father decided it was time to start training him in the ways of the family business. Harold, however, would have none of it. I would not be apprenticed, he recounted many years later. I was not going to work for anybody for nothing. I wanted to be paid for my labor. His father persisted and took his son to Liverpool to look at businesses there, but Harold was just as persistent. I meant what I said. I am not going to be apprenticed, and that settles it. To emphasize his point, Harold ran away from home around the age of 15 and took a place aboard a schooner. Which one has been lost to time, but we have been able to establish some of the subsequent ones. Beginning in 1900, Lowe served as an ordinary and able seaman on ships such as the Marion Lass, the William Keith, the British Queen, the Cortez, the Balasaur, and the Ormsuri, visiting Chile, Australia, and Hawaii before joining the Royal Navy Reserve in 1904. On August 6, 1904, he signed on to the SS Prometheus, a steel screw steamer operated by the Blue Funnel Line. On November 10, 1904, while the ship was in Amsterdam, the Prometheus collided with the Pecton. While the Prometheus was ultimately found not responsible for the collision, this incident resulted in Lowe's first time sitting as a witness at a Board of Trade inquiry. Lowe would sign off from the Prometheus 11 days later while on a trip to Japan. He spent several months of 1905 aboard the SS Telemachus, where Lowe gained a reputation for feats of physical courage, bravery, and quick action. In one account, Harold leapt into the sea to rescue a sailor who had fallen overboard, despite being stricken with a bout of blood poisoning. In the other, with their ship caught in a terrible storm, the captain asked for a volunteer to go aloft into the rigging to take care of something to ensure the safety of the ship and her crew. The captain was met with silence until Lowe chimed in. I will go. May as well die from the yard as the deck. January 1906 found him in Liverpool to sit for his second mate certificate examination. He sadly failed on his first attempt, having been tripped up by what is known as the rules of the road. At sea, the rules of the road is in reference to procedures to avoid collisions such as sailing red to red or green to green with other ships. Ships, just like modern day airplanes, are equipped with colored lights to help other ships differentiate port from starboard, which tells them in which direction a ship is moving. If two ships are passing each other, they should pass red to red or port to port or green to green, starboard to starboard. A nifty poem is created just for this situation. Green to green, red to red, perfect safety, go ahead. Lowe would have to wait six months before he could retake the exam, but he finally passed on his second attempt, and his second mate's certificate was officially issued 
on August 24th, 1906. With this certificate, we also get our first glimpse into Harold's physical appearance. At the age of 23, he stood 5 foot 8 inches tall, had a dark complexion, likely in reference to a tan, and had brown hair and brown eyes. It is also noted that he had a tattoo, his initials HTL inside a heart on his right forearm. Certificate acquired, Lowe could now take work as a ship's officer, though it would take some time before he could obtain a position as one. Being a hawspiper, a slang term in reference to sailors who worked their way up the ranks, from ordinary seaman to officer with no formal training, Lowe found it a little difficult to find someone that had enough confidence in his skills to take him on. He refused to take a step back and return to the duties of an able seaman, though, and so held out, trudging from shipping office to shipping office in search of an opening. Nearly out of money, he finally found one as third officer aboard the SS Ardeola, which ran to the Canary Islands for stores of fruit. Though his time with the Ardeola was brief, he made a good impression with her captain, who gave Lowe a particularly glowing reference as an attentive officer to his various duties, always obliging and strictly sober. Being an ardent teetotaler as a result of his father's history of heavy drinking, Lowe no doubt took pride in this description of his character. After leaving the Ardeola, he transferred to the Elder Dempster Line to work the West African run until July 1908, when he sat for his first mate certificate exam in Liverpool. Unfortunately, he once again failed on his first attempt, this time in navigation. Definitely not one to be easily deterred, he took it again seven days later and passed, and his official certificate was issued on July 30th. He stayed with the Elder Dempster Line on the West African trade run for the rest of 1908 and into 1909 as a senior officer until he was called back home to Wales in the spring of 1909. He had received news that his mother Harriet has suffered a stroke on March 21st. In a coma from which he would never recover, she passed away only a short time later at the young age of 53. Lowe returned to the African run until October 26, 1910 when he sat for his master's certificate exam in Liverpool. Just like with his first two certificates, he failed on his first attempt, once again in navigation. He passed on his second attempt on November 7th, and at the age of 27, Harold Lowe was officially a certified master mariner. Lowe had also made advancements with his personal life. It was around this time that he became engaged to Ellen Marion Whitehouse, affectionately known as Nellie. He joined the White Star Line on April 8, 1911, and his first appointment was as fourth officer with the SS Tropic, where he received a last-minute promotion to third just two weeks later when the original third officer was transferred to another ship. Harold later moved over to the Belgic for a particularly horrendous voyage to Australia before returning home to Liverpool on February 21, 1912, only to find that many ships had been laid up due to a coal strike. Prospects of a new berth seemed dim, but Lowe's years of hard work were about to pay off. Despite the strike, there was an influx of certified officers in the merchant service around this time, and the White Star Line had the freedom to be picky when it came to who served on the bridge. White Star clearly had a penchant for choosing the best of the best to command their ships, especially when it came to making a good first impression with their newest, most glamorous ones. Lowe was chosen to join White Star's latest liner as 5th officer, and at noon on March 27, 1912, he and his fellow junior officers arrived at Harland & Wolfe in Belfast and greeted their new ship, RMS Titanic. On Titanic, Lowe found himself to be the odd man out. The other officers had all sailed together before and all had crossed the North Atlantic before, neither of which Lowe had done. He was also the only officer on board who was never apprenticed as a boy and had never attended any formal training school. This was in no way detrimental, however, as his skills and knowledge easily matched that of his formerly trained fellows. On April 2nd, the Titanic's sea trials took place. Lowe joined 6th Officer Moody for the lifeboat tests on the starboard side. The lifeboat test was basically the inspection to make sure all the equipment was in place and stowed properly, then a few were launched, rode around the lock, then hoisted back up the davits and stowed. Once the trials were complete, Titanic was officially certified and allowed to leave Belfast. Once Harlan and Wolf's workmen returned to shore, Titanic set off for Southampton, 
crossing with calm seas and a gentle breeze. That evening, the officers enjoyed the first meal served on board in the dining saloon. Two menus for this meal still exist today. One was saved as a souvenir by second officer Charles Lightoller, who gifted it to his wife Sylvia just before departing Southampton. It sold at auction in 2018 for £100,000. The other belonged to Lowe, who jotted a note onto it and sent it away in the post at Cherbourg for his fiance Nelly. This copy sold at auction in 2004 for £51,000. Titanic arrived in Southampton at 1.30 a.m. on April 4th, where she would remain for the next six days, while last-minute finishing touches were completed and other necessities were brought on board. On sailing day, April 10th, after the general muster of the crew at 8.30, another lifeboat test was carried out by Lowe and Moody to practice lowering away and clearing. It took no more than 30 minutes and was overseen by British Board of Trade Immigration Officer Captain Morris Harvey Clark in order to make sure Titanic was in compliance with the Merchant Shipping Acts. She passed the tests and was cleared for departure at noon. And as the new liner set off on her maiden voyage, Lowe manned the telephones on the bridge, connecting messages from pilot George Bowyer and Captain Smith to Second Officer Lightoller stationed forward and First Officer Murdoch stationed aft. After making brief stops in Cherbourg, France and Queenstown, Ireland, Titanic finally set out for open seas, where Harold quickly settled into his shipboard routine. His last watch on Sunday, April 14th, ended at 8 p.m. 15 to 30 minutes later, he was in his cabin, fast asleep. He later recalled, We don't get any too much sleep, and when we sleep, we die. In other words, the rigorous watch rotation of four-hour watches and two-hour dog watches didn't allow for much sleeping time. Therefore, when you did finally manage to get some shy, you slept like the dead. When the Titanic struck the iceberg at 11.40, he didn't stir. Nor did he stir when 4th Officer Boxall stuck his head into his cabin to tell him what had happened. When he finally did wake up, it was to the voices of passengers outside his cabin, which he found unusual, considering the officer's promenade was off-limits to them. When he peered out his window, he was confronted with the sight of passengers in their life belts, waiting as the lifeboats were being cleared and readied. As he quickly dressed, he also realized something else was terribly wrong. Titanic was down by the bow by a good degree. He wasn't prone to panic, though, and he promptly went out on deck to begin assisting with the lifeboats. By 12.40 a.m., he and First Officer Murdoch had their first boat away. At this point in time, Lowe was working under the guideline of women and children first, regardless of class or nationality. There was no such thing as selecting. It was simply the first woman, whether first class, second class, third class, or 67th class. It was all the same. Women and children were first. As for how many got into the boat, Lowe was a little hesitant to put more than 30, or at most 50, into a boat while it was still on the davits. He was concerned that filling it to its designed floating capacity, while still suspended, would cause it to buckle. And there appears to have been a general agreement that the boats would be partially filled, that the movie rode around to one of the gangway doors to take on more people once it was afloat. This was the first boat to be launched, and both Lowe and William Murdoch tried to encourage passengers to get in, but they were reluctant. A peculiar incident occurred during the launch of Lifeboat 5. Lowe, while on his hands and knees, assisting in getting the lifeboat away, was confronted with a passenger in a frenzy. If you will get to hell out of that, I shall be able to do something, he recalled telling the passenger. Do you want me to lower away quickly? You will have me drown the whole lot of them. It wasn't until he was on board the Carpathia that Lowe learned that this passenger was the managing director of the White Star Line, J. Bruce Ismay. One of the most often criticized facts of the evacuation is that many of the boats were launched only partially filled, and many blame this fact on crew incompetence, which couldn't be further from the truth. 12.55 was still fairly early on in the sinking, and many passengers at this point weren't as concerned about the situation as they should have been. Many were in flat-out denial that the ship was even sinking. 
The reason why Lifeboat 3 left with only 32 occupants is, simply put, because passengers didn't want to get in it. There did not seem to be any people there, Lev recalled. Those that were there did not seem to want to go. I hollered out, who's next for the boat? And there was no response. It was a very similar situation with Lifeboat 1, which was an emergency cutter and slightly smaller than the other boats. This one was infamously nicknamed the Millionaire's Boat, since first-class passengers Sir Cosmo and Lady Duff Gordon were on board. After the disaster, when questioned about why so few were on this boat, Lowe explained that it wasn't for lack of trying to get more on. He and Murdoch took everyone they could and cleared the boat deck around number one of passengers. To ensure they took on as many as they could, they even had the boat stop at a deck on the way down, in case anyone was there. But it was empty. There simply weren't enough people to fill it, and they were forced to launch the boat partially filled. Once the four forward starboard boats were launched, Lowe crossed over to the port side, where he met 6th Officer Moody, who was filling lifeboat 16. After 14 was full and ready to leave, Lowe noted, I told Mr. Moody on my own that I had seen five boats go away, and an officer ought to go in one of these boats. I asked him who it was to be, him or I, and he told me, You go. I will get in another boat. A crewman by the name of Joseph Scarrett, who was in lifeboat 14 when Lowe boarded, recalled this conversation and was under the impression that the other boat Moody mentioned was Lifeboat 16, since it was the next one over. Lowe seemed to be under the same impression. However, for reasons unknown, James Moody would never take command of a lifeboat, and he would not survive the night. As Boat 14 was lowered, Lowe became concerned with the possibility that passengers still on board Titanic would attempt to rush it, which would threaten the boat's safety. With 40 passengers on board, Lowe was afraid he had overfilled it, and feared that the sudden jerk of someone jumping in would prove catastrophic, either causing it to buckle or to tip over, especially since it was being lowered while Titanic was likely at a 45-degree angle. The only way that he could be sure to keep additional people from boarding was to brandish a pistol. This was his personal pistol, a Browning Automatic, and he was the only junior officer to carry a firearm that night. He fired three shots over the side into the water, his deterrent worked, and boat 14 was allowed to reach the water below and row away. Once clear of the ship, Lowe decided to keep his boat approximately 150 yards away. He wanted to stay close so that he could pick up people from the water as they came by. He met up with four other lifeboats, 4, 10, 12, and Collapsible D, which he roped together, then he transferred the passengers from boat 14 and evenly distributed them amongst the other four boats. He needed an empty one, and volunteers. Lowe made the now controversial decision to wait roughly an hour to an hour and a half. Many people, both in 1912 and today, have criticized him for this decision, implying that it was inhumane for him to not go back for survivors sooner. However, at the U.S. inquiry into the disaster, Lowe explained his actions in detail. It would not have been wise or safe for me to have gone there before, because the whole lot of us would have been swamped, and then nobody would have been saved. What are you going to do with a boat of 65 where 1,600 people are drowning? I was just on the margin. If anybody had struggled out of the mass, I was there to pick them up. But it was useless for me go to go into the mass. It would have been suicide. Senator Smith remarked that he could have saved more, but Lowe was adamant. You could not do it, sir. I made the attempt, sir, as soon as any man could do so, and I am not scared of saying it. At the British inquiry, the White Star Line's representative, Sir Robert Finlay, came to Lowe's defense. He waited, an operation of the most painful character, requiring great nerve and great coolness. He waited until the sea had done its work for the great majority of people, and then put back and picked up a few of the survivors. But to suggest, as some questions which were put suggested, that there was inhumanity in not pushing into that crowd of drowning people in the hope of saving them is, I submit, a course based on ignorance of the fundamental conditions that attend on the endeavor to save people who are struggling in the water, when, if you push your boat among them, the only result will be that those in the boat are added to the role of victims. When Lowe and Boat 14 did return to the wreck, 
it was with a crew of approximately nine volunteers, including sailors Joseph Scarrett, Frank Oliver Evans, and Edward Bewley, and passenger Charles Williams. As they slowly made their way into the mass, they found it extremely awkward to maneuver the boat through the wreckage. With hundreds of victims scattered around them, it was almost impossible to row, but they ultimately managed to rescue four people from the water. The first was William Fisher Hoyt, a 43-year-old American businessman traveling first class. Despite the crew's best efforts to revive him, however, Hoyt succumbed a short time after being rescued. Also rescued were 23-year-old saloon steward Howard Fillimore and a 26-year-old third-class passenger from Hong Kong known as Fang Lang, whose real name was Wing Sun Fong. Both survived. The fourth survivor's identity is unknown. By daybreak, Lowe concluded that there was no one left to rescue from the water. They hoisted sail and headed over to take Collapsible D under tow. Shortly after, they found another collapsible in desperate need of assistance. It was Collapsible A, partially submerged with 21 people aboard up to their ankles in water. Lowe transferred these passengers onto his boat, but left three who had perished during the night. At 4 a.m., RMS Carpathia arrived under the command of Captain Arthur Rostron. Lowe, with his boat still under sail, quickly headed towards her, fearing that they wouldn't be seen, and Carpathia would leave without them. The other lifeboats did the same, and the survivors were taken aboard over the course of the next four and a half hours. Once all were safely on board, Lowe met up with some of the people from his boats and exchanged contact details. Captain Rostrand turned Carpathia for New York, where she arrived on the evening of April 18th. The surviving officers, crew, and Bruce Ismay were promptly subpoenaed once they were on American ground and the U.S. inquiry into the disaster began at the Waldorf Astoria Hotel the following day. Lowe developed a strong dislike for Senator Smith, often getting frustrated with his questioning and providing short, flippant, combative, and sometimes sarcastic answers. Do you know what an iceberg is composed of? Ice, I suppose, sir? Lowe's attitude was likely soured by the fact that he had been accused of drinking the night the Titanic sank. An ardent teetotaler, Lowe testified that he was an abstainer and had never touched alcohol in his life. He no doubt took strong offense at the accusation, as seven days later, he requested to have his status as a teetotaler included on the record. After the U.S. inquiry concluded, the four surviving officers of the Titanic and Bruce Ismay departed New York on May 2, 1912 aboard the Adriatic to return to England. They arrived in Liverpool on May 11th, where Lowe was met on the dock by his sister Ada and his father George. He was promptly summoned to appear before the British inquiry into the loss of the Titanic, and he sat for questioning on May 22nd and May 23rd. He was questioned early on about the lifeboat test conducted in Belfast, during which six officer Moody was mentioned. When asked if Moody had been lost in the sinking, Lowe didn't answer, focusing instead on other particulars of the test. Whether he didn't hear this query into Moody's loss, or if he simply ignored it, is uncertain. But what we do know is that Harold Lowe took Moody's death hard. He received a number of letters after the disaster, and he tried to answer every one of them personally. But when he received one from Moody's family, he couldn't reply. He instead asked his father to do it on his behalf. Once the British inquiry concluded, Lowe finally returned home to Barmouth, Wales, where he was met by 1,300 people and a reception held in his honor. Barmouth had been working hard to honor their hometown hero, and for the last two months had been distributing pamphlets in order to raise funds for a gift. They raised enough money to present Lowe with a commemorative gold watch, inscribed with the words, Presented to Harold Godfrey Lowe, 5th Officer RMS Titanic, by his friends in Barmouth and elsewhere, in recognition and appreciation of his gallant services at the foundering of the Titanic, 15th April, 1912. A newspaper reported a few months later that Lowe was so touched by this gesture that he could only express his gratitude with a single sentence. He later added to the watch chain a gold sovereign he had received from a survivor aboard the Carpathia in exchange for a souvenir. Lowe was also presented with a complete set of nautical instruments, including a telescope and sextant, which were gifted to him from surviving first-class passenger Renee Harris of New York. These remained in the Lowe family collection until they were auctioned off in November 2020. 
the telescope reportedly sold for £50,000. Lowe stayed with the White Star Line for the remainder of 1912 and into the spring of 1913 on the run to Australia. His appearance there caused a stir as he had gained something of a celebrity status at the Titanic disaster, but he refused to talk about it anymore. After two grueling inquiries, he was tired of it all, and he just wanted to put it behind him. On September 24, 1913, Harold and his fiancée Nellie were married at St. Paul's Church in Colwyn Bay, Wales, and they settled down in the home of Nellie's father, who was in ill health and needed care. By April 1914, Lowe was in training with the Royal Navy Reserve in Gunnery School aboard HMS Excellent and torpedo training aboard HMS Vernon. By June, he was officially assigned to HMS Victory. Yes, that HMS Victory, Lord Nelson's own, but likely only on a shore-based capacity. A quick side fact, HMS Victory, though she is in dry dock now as a museum, is still in active commission with the Royal Navy today. She'll likely never see battle again, but I just think the mere possibility of it, kind of hilarious. But anyway, I digress. The British Admiralty sent the fleet a warning telegram, and the order for full naval mobilization was given on August 1st. On November 20th, 1914, just a day before his own birthday, Nellie gave birth to their first child, a daughter named Florence Josephine, affectionately known as Josie. Can we just take a second to appreciate this picture? I mean, just look at her little face. Sorry, moving on. In July 1915, Lowe was promoted to lieutenant in the Royal Navy Reserve. From early 1916 to the spring of 1917, he served aboard the HMS Donegal before heading back home. And with this return, he had not two members of his family waiting for him, but three. On March 21st, 1916, Harold and Nellie's second child was born, a son named Harold William George. Harold returned to naval training aboard HMS Excellent, where he earned the rank of Lieutenant Commander, then HMS Suffolk, where he visited many different ports of call around the world, including South Africa, Mauritius, Singapore, Malaysia, Hong Kong, Japan, and Vladivostok. He appears to have developed an interest in photography during this time as he kept a personal photographic log on board with him. The First World War officially ended at 11 a.m. on November 11, 1918, and after a further few months of service, Harold was demobilized on June 10, 1919, and he returned home, where he stayed for just a few more months before returning to sea, a brief since on the Portland run with the White Star Line's SS Jacobin and the North Atlantic run on the SS Dominion, and the big four ship SS Cedric. Work began to slow in 1921, and he was put on standby on several ships before finally being put on half pay in 1922. He eventually found work again, and he spent the next six years traveling the world for the White Star Line. Tragedy once again struck the Lowe family in March 11, 1927, when Harold's younger brother Edward, who had also taken up a career at sea, and was by this time living in New Zealand, passed away at the age of 33 after being lost overboard. His body, unfortunately, was never recovered. On November 21, 1927, Harold's 45th birthday, he was released from the Royal Navy Reserve with the rank of Lieutenant Commander. And just a year later, his father George passed away at the age of 81. Lowe's last placement was as second officer on the Canada run aboard the SS Dark in 1928 which he served on for roughly two and a half years before the Great Depression gripped the world, and he once again had difficulty finding work. He ultimately resigned from the White Star Line on May 26, 1931, aged just 49. He and his family up stakes and moved to Degenwee, Wales, where he took up a number of hobbies, including boating, fishing, and shooting. As he put it, he wanted to enjoy these pastimes for at least 10 years before he was too old to do so. He also became a church warden and entered local politics when he was elected to the Degenwee Ward of Conway Borough Council, which he served on for two years before retiring in 1938. By 1939, the world was once again at war and Lowe was ready to serve, though this time he remained on land. On May 7, 1939, his home became a sector post after he volunteered as an air raid warden for his district. 
Harold stayed at his post until 1942, when his health took a turn. The malaria he had picked up in his younger years on the African run returned with a vengeance. He suffered a debilitating stroke and was afterwards confined to a wheelchair. He was well cared for by his wife and soon-to-be daughter-in-law, who stayed with the family while her fiancé was in Burma, and Nellie would often wheel her husband down to view the sea. He never regained his full health, and Harold Lowe passed away on May 12, 1944, at the age of 61. He was buried in St. Trillo's Parish Church on the coast of North Wales, and his grave is situated with a beautiful view of the sea. His headstone is in the shape of an open book, and his widow Nellie chose the inscription. In loving memory of my devoted husband, Harold Godfrey Lowe, Commander, Royal Navy Reserve, who passed away May 12, 1944. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Titanic is not mentioned. Nellie followed him in death on February 10, 1947, at the age of 63, and she was interred with her husband. Their daughter Florence passed away in 1996 at the age of 82, and her ashes were interred with her parents. On April 10, 2012, to mark Titanic's 100th anniversary, the Degenwee History Group and the Conwy Town Council unveiled a blue plaque at the Low Home in Degenwee. In attendance at the unveiling was Harold and Nellie's grandson, John, a merchant marine captain who resided in the home. Five days later, on April 15th, after a successful campaign by then 18-year-old student Maddie Matthews, a plaque dedicated to Harold Lowe's heroism was unveiled at the Harbor Master's office in Barmouth. While Harold Lowe is mainly remembered for his heroism on the night the Titanic was lost, he would insist that he didn't really do anything that extraordinary. Many people tend to think of him as short-tempered or even rude, but that couldn't be further from the truth. He could become an enthusiastic, yes, and he had a great sense of humor, but excited to the point of any reduction of self-control? No, his son once recalled. My father was one of the most even-tempered men I have ever met. On the flip side, he often surprised his family with his use of strong language. A distant relation, Janet Lowe, once recalled, His manners were those of a perfect Victorian gentleman, with language littered with high seas invective. He loved the sea, adored his family, and treasured his children. He behaved with duty, honor, and self-discipline, and had little patience for anyone who didn't do the same. If you asked him now, though, he would likely tell you that he just wants to be remembered as a decent man with a beautiful family who wanted nothing else out of life than to simply be happy.